Okay, welcome once again. We do quite a few of these sorts of events, although this one is particular, it's special. Not quite like most of the events we organize. So in any case, welcome to those of you who are not from Georgetown itself, and indeed, welcome to those of you who are from Georgetown. Um, those of you who are not, uh, my name is Gerd Nonneman, I'm the Dean of this wonderful institution. And today, we have the pleasure and the honor of introducing and having with us Prajan Jayasaro, a Buddhist monk, of course, which you know, otherwise he wouldn't have been here. Now, he was born not in Thailand, but in England in 1958, um, and during his teens already felt a strong pull to Asia and traveled over land there when I think he was 17, um, and came back convinced that, that the, so, something there was really what, where his, his future lay. Um, he learned about both Thailand and uh, spiritual development, um, and by the time he returned to England, his plans of going to university were abandoned, or continuing at university were abandoned, and he decided to pursue Buddhism as a practice and way of life. In fact, it's in England, after he was back there, that he discovered the possibility of not just pursuing this general practice, but becoming a Buddhist monk. Um, in late 78, he went to the northeast of Thailand, where he became a disciple of Venerable Ajahn Chah, who is one of the seminal figures in 20th century Buddhist uh, monasticism, and indeed also one of the greatest contemporary uh, masters of meditation. He became a novice monk in 79 and then a fully ordained monk in 1980. And he's been living in the forests of northeast Thailand ever since. For five years, from, seven, uh, from 97 to 2002, he was the abbot of Wat Pananachat, which is a forest mon monastery. Um, it, it provides, it's unique indeed in, in Asia, providing traditional forest monastic training in English. And the community there was drawn from about 20 different countries. In 2002, he relinquished that role and since then, he's been living alone in a hermitage at the foot of the Kauai mountain range. He's written a large number of books uh, in Thai, um, not in English uh, so far, I imagine. Um, and he teaches occasional meditation retreats. And indeed, I think um, one or two of his disciples or his, his students are here with us today. He's also, for the last uh, few years, been an advisor to a growing movement that seeks to integrate Buddhism in, or Buddhist practice into Thai uh, education. And his discussion with us today will be on the subject of happiness. I will leave um, him to, to lead, to first present his thoughts on that, share his thoughts with us all, and then he will simply have a, an informal a question and answer session after that. Uh, so good evening, everyone. And um, I, perhaps I would, I should begin, uh, for those of you who, who have not had any uh, contact or ever read anything or um, studied anything about this particular school of Buddhism um, that it is uh, not in any way an um, evangelical tradition and uh, it is far from my mind um, to try to persuade or inspire you to become Buddhist this evening but I do feel that there is a lot in the Buddhist tradition um, that people of other religions and traditions or of no religion uh, can make use of in their life and I'm very happy to be able to share some of my thoughts, reflections, experiences with you this evening with that goal in mind. Um, <clears throat> one of the um, uh, key 
uh, teachings, or not a key teaching, but one which uh, has quite an influence um, on uh, his students, um, was that my teacher uh, forbade monks giving public talks uh, from preparing anything in advance. They have to be spontaneous. Um, so um, one of the most enjoyable um, elements of giving a talk for me is that I don't you know, really know exactly where it's going to go. And so uh, the talk won't be particularly well structured, but I hope that um, nevertheless um, I will be able to um, share some things with you which you will enjoy and benefit from. I'd like, like to begin with, with making just a general observation um, about Buddhism because it can be quite a puzzling and elusive tradition uh, for those who brought, um, brought up in, in other religious traditions and cultures. And I would like to suggest that the religions that grew up in this part of the world, in the Middle East, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the great monotheistic traditions, uh, may be um, grouped together um, as belief systems. And indeed, the word religion and faith, uh, these words are used almost interchangeably these days. We say the great religions, the great faiths, which I think points very clearly to the fact that faith is considered the preeminent virtue in these religions. Um, Buddhism um, is a diff comes from a different family of religions, and it's a different kind of religion. It's a different idea of what a religion is or might be. Um, and this is why it's, it's so um, uh, puzzling and many people say this isn't a religion, it's, surely it's a philosophy or it's a way of life or something. So um, my understanding is that, that Buddhism is a religion but that it is not um, one of the belief system family of religions but it is essentially an education system. So, so the idea of a religion as an education system is probably a rather unusual one. Um, but it is, I think, essential to, to really have a grasp of the Buddhist teachings and, and indeed the Buddhist teachings on happiness. So although faith is not um, rejected, it's considered as one element of an education process or an education system and one which has to be developed um, within a context, um, one which has to be governed by and um, moderated by the critical faculty because the, the particular value of faith is that it clarifies and it uh, leads to passion and effort and concerted effort so it has a very strong um, emotional impact. The, the shadow side of faith is that it can very easily um, become fanaticism or superstition. So in, in Buddhism, the attitude towards faith is it's, a, it's like a double-edged sword. It's something which has a certain uh, value, essential value in this education process, but one which has to be carefully monitored to prevent it from um, degenerating into something else uh, which would uh, have detrimental rather than positive um, effects. So the, um, one of the um, key um, principles of this school of, of Buddhism um, is, the, uh, is a belief nevertheless. It is an article of faith. Um, but the article of the, the chief fundamental article of faith is faith in the human capacity for enlightenment or the human capacity for what we might call true or 
um, unfettered, unlimited happiness. And that can be broken down or to, to be expressed as a belief in the human capacity to be free, to let go of, to abandon uh, toxic mental states, the capacity, the um, potential um, for human beings to cultivate uh, positive, uplifting, ennobling mental states and for the human being to purify their minds, to liberate themselves from all suffering and its causes. So this, the, the particular um, quality or the um, character of this faith is that it is something that has to be uh, put to the test uh, for it to be authentic. So um, if you have a belief that you don't have to be the prey of negative or um, uh, what I call toxic mental states um, that you can um, lead your life in such a way, you can practice in such a way as to abandon these toxic mental states through your own efforts, then um, you're, you have to put that to the test, don't you? Well, can you? Is it really possible? Uh, if you believe that you can cultivate uh, positive, uplifting, ennobling mental states, then you're duty-bound, honor-bound um, to put that to the test. So this is uh, the, the key feature of faith in Buddhist terminology, as the, in the Buddhist way of talking about it, is um, the extent to which it leads to wise effort. So wise effort is a, is a test um, of faith, the quality of faith, the nature of faith. Now, the, um, the Buddha um, proposed that life for what we uh, call the unenlightened individual is one which is never free from the shadow, at least the shadow, of some kind of pain. That there is um, within us a fundamental sense of lack or something not quite right, something missing. We might call it a lack of true happiness. Now the, the word which is used to uh, express this in, in the Pali language used by the Buddha um, and in, the, in which the Buddhist texts are expressed is Dukkha, which is usually translated into English as suffering. But the relationship between suffering as it's usually understood and Dukkha is um, a little bit like the difference between a very bright red color and the concept of color itself. So it's one very bright, very uh, prominent, extreme expression of color, but it doesn't express the concept of color altogether. And dukkha is um, a concept that covers um, the whole spectrum of experience, right from quite severe physical and mental distress all the way uh, up to very refined um, states of bliss um, and pure consciousness. The, um, the unenlightened um, being is always uh, presented, always um, influenced by this sense of lack and we seek to escape from that sense of lack in various ways, some more skillful, more intelligent than others. The Buddha uh, taught that our 
efforts to escape from this sense of lack, that something's not quite right, that something's not quite fulfilling, um, that however much we have, however much we get, is still not quite enough, that we tend to um, assume that the answer lies to in the um, the gaining of some particular kind of experience and we look for that experience outside of ourselves but the, uh, the kind of classic simile or metaphor for, for, for that kind of search is, is that of someone with a, a cracked vessel um, in which the liquid um, flows out relentlessly, um, tries to uh, increase the volume of the, the fluid which is poured into the vessel rather than repairing the vessel itself. So in the, in the search for happiness and the very fact that um, we search for happiness, you know, is in itself an admission that we feel we lack it. Um, is based upon certain premises, basic understanding of who we are, what life is, and what is happiness, um, which are often unexamined and um, based upon things that we've been told, things that we've absorbed through the culture and through our surroundings. And Buddha um, tells us to take nothing for granted, absolutely nothing, and to really look at the nature of happiness as we experience it, or to the extent to which we've experienced it, or to the things that we believe uh, give us or will give us happiness, and to our experience of the lack of happiness um, and to the one who wishes to be happy. Who is that one who wishes to be happy? Um, so we often have a, um, a lot of uh, contradictory, conflicting ideas about who we are, about what we want and Many of us, I, I think, um, can be, there's, a, there's a quite a disconnect between the logic and the systematic way we approach our life in the world and our careers and the way that we approach our inner life, uh, completely lacking in any uh, kind of systematic analysis, systematic um, development of those causes and conditions that lead to happiness. So this, this particular phrase I just used there is, is, is one of the most important and most um, uh, commonly used phrases that comes up again and again in Buddhist discourse, causes and conditions. So we're always taught to, what are the causes and conditions uh, for success? What are the causes and conditions uh, for failure, what are the causes and conditions uh, for happiness causes and so this um, view of the internal world as following the same pattern and responding um, to the same uh, strategies um, that we pursue in the out outer world. If we have some problem in, um, in business or in some uh, mechanical process. Um, we don't usually pray or just hope for some um, successful resolution to that. Um, I think in the real world what we do is say, what is this problem? What's caused the problem? What can we do about it? And, and so the Buddha is saying we should try to apply this same kind of effort to our inner, our inner being and our inner experience and that it's not anything mystical or uh, highfalutin, it's just uh, an elevated form of common sense, if you like. So we're taught to observe our experience, 
No. So what, what is it that, when do we experience our feelings of, of happiness? Are there different levels, different kinds of happiness? If there are, are they compatible? Or is it possible that certain kinds of happiness um, have to be abandoned or have to be put to one side if we want to experience other kinds of happiness? Is there a hierarchy of happiness? Is it possible to say certain kinds of happiness are superior to, to other kinds of happiness? Um, this is the kind of um, analysis and effort that, that the Buddha recommended for us. So, so one uh, proposal, uh, one, one um, hypothesis here, um, is that the, the more conditioned um, an experience of happiness is, the more inferior it is. The less conditioned a form of happiness is, then the more superior it is. And that the ultimate happiness is one which is completely unconditioned. So, um, experience of pleasure and happiness through seeing something um, beautiful, hearing something pleasant, um, some uh, pleasure happiness experience through the senses um, is not considered sinful or bad, but really kind of low quality happiness. Um, because um, it's dependent on so many causes and conditions, uh, few of which we have control over. Um, it's also um, dependent upon um, the physical body. Uh, so certain um, pleasures available through the eyes um, become less accessible as the power of sight declines through age, or if there's an accident and you lose your sight, then that access to that particular kind of pleasure is completely lost. But also in the physical body, um, exp uh, the pleasure and happiness we experience through the physical body is usually um, related to some kind of stimulus. And the kinds of pleasure dependent upon stimulus um, tend to um, be affected by the law of diminishing returns. And that's seen most obviously, of course, in, uh, in drug use, uh, where, um, to begin with, somebody might take one pill or one dose and experience some pleasure, uh, but then after a while they need two pills to get the same pleasure that they got from one, and then more and more and more. So the kinds of pleasure that arise through the body are subject to the law of diminishing returns. Also, the physical body can only take so much stimulus, and then it gets tired, it gets exhausted, or we need to sleep, we need to eat, we need, we need some kind of relief. Um, so these are a few of the reasons why the kind of pleasures, the kind of happiness that we experience through the sense doors um, are rather unfulfilling. And there's always this sense, as I say, of it's not quite enough. You know, you <clears throat> before very... Uh, and if we look at the, the whole process of um, searching for, experiencing uh, pleasure in the world, we notice that the actual feeling of desire for something is in itself, as a feeling, is rather unpleasant. And when we want something, so we really desire something, at that moment we can perhaps observe that partly we want to get rid of the feeling of desire for it. Um, the attainment of the object will take away this sense of lack and desire. And in the um, effort to gain some particular experience, some particular object which we feel will make us happy, um, then we can uh, often notice that uh, we may be willing to compromise on certain moral standards because the, the, the desire to gain something um, is so compelling um, that we can um, start to tell lies to ourselves or think that well, it's really okay or everybody else does it and be uh, obviously a major cause of corruption 
in the world. But the, the tension of desire builds up and our, the way that we look at other people changes. Um, from people being friends and colleagues and loved ones, they can often uh, become to see competitors because usually the things that we desire are things that other people desire. We start to feel jealous of people who already have those things that we think um, will make us happy. So a lot of these what I would call toxic mental states are arising um, together with this effort to attain some particular kind of object which we would believe will provide us with happiness. And at the moment that we do experience that object, the, the incredible high, the rush that we feel, is often, very, to a large extent, just the release of the tension of desire for, for that object. And once we have gained an object, then we meet another um, very powerful, probably one of the most powerful um, features of human psychology, and that's um, the fact that we get used to things, that we can't sustain the same intensity of pleasure in even the most uh, wonderful and desirable object. We get used to things. And if something is, uh, uh, is very important to us, then of course, before long we have the, all the tension and the worries about protecting it, looking after it. And then deep in our mind is the fear of separation from that object and the eventual separation itself. So if we look at the whole, the whole process of desire, search, attainment, uh, even more so, of course, to disappointment when we can't get the things that we want, but even in the case that we do, then you see it's rather, it's rather unsatisfactory. So um, one of the uh, ideas um, I'd like to sh share with you today is that <clears throat> we, we put too much attention on those things, those experiences uh, which will, we believe will provide us with happiness and not enough attention on our capacity to experience happiness. That, uh, in ha so I'm talking about happiness here or as a, a faculty of happiness, as it were. So we can talk about it like an appreciation of an artwork. Let's say uh, someone who has had no formal education um, and was uh, to look at a cartoon um, and the Mona Lisa or some masterpiece of Western art, it's quite likely, I think, that the uneducated person would prefer the cartoon. Um, but with education, the appreciation of the, the genius of da Vinci or whoever, then the appreciation of the, uh, the work of art increases. And so um, I'd like to suggest that there's an analogy here that we have an uneducated, uncultivated um, appreciation of happiness um, which um, gradually disappears through um, a cultivation of the mind and the faculties of the mind and a growing skill um, in dealing um, wisely and constructively with negative mental states and a systematic cultivation of positive mental states. Of these positive mental states, uh, one key one which you may have um, be familiar with because it's becoming almost a, a buzzword these days in many different fields, and that's mindfulness. Um, and mindfulness is, um, is explained in, in, in many ways now, and, and it's somewhat um, kind of fuzzy. Uh, concept, I think, the way that it's being promoted in secular circles a little bit, uh, deviated a little bit from uh, the Buddhist presentation. But anyway, let, let's just um, uh, say very simply, it's the ability to be present to your life. And so much of our lives are led uh, on automatic pilot. And 
we're so caught up in memories and anticipation and expectation and thoughts and desires um, that uh, we're not really present to our life because our, the only life we have is right here and now. But um, our capacity to be present, to be real here and now, is not something that comes easily. It's something that comes through an education and a training and an interest in applying ourselves to developing that skill. So um, being in the present moment does not in any way uh, mean an abandonment of thoughts of the past or thoughts of the future. Um, that would be both impossible and even if it was possible it would be idiotic. Uh, we need to be obviously learning from experience using um, past knowledge and experience to inform the present moment and we need to be making um, uh, judgments about priorities, what needs to be done first, what needs to be done later, what's important, what's not important and so on. So being in the present moment um, is in no way conf in conflict with that. Um, but what it means is that we're developing an ability to be aware of thought as thought and aware of memory as memory. So not um, becoming uh, caught up in and identifying or creating a sense of self um, from memories or thoughts, not um, retreating from present moment present challenges into um, thoughts and fantasies and memories, but developing ability to be present to life. Um, so this is not a matter of suppressing or repressing um, any element of experience, but merely um, being aware of it for what it is already. So when you have a thought, it's possible to see experience that as a thought. So being able to um, relate to experience as process rather than becoming obsessed with content. And, and many of the meditation practices um, taught in Buddhist tradition, indeed in other traditions, um, are, are leading us to, to away from this uh, obsession with the content of experience and developing this perspective of experience as process. Indeed, in, in the Buddhist view, it could be said there are no nouns. Uh, there, are, there are actually no nouns. So the body is a verb, it's not a noun. Uh, feelings, perceptions, thoughts, emotions, sense consciousness, these are all seen as, in this analogy, verbs rather than nouns. The mind is not a noun, it's not a thing. It's a process through time. And this uh, is that a philosophical position, um, but it is um, a, a growing um, awareness that comes through developing the ability to look directly at experience without distraction. So our minds are uh, these days on such, uh, such so much of the time uh, on such a superficial level. Um, that we are alienated from what's really going on inside of ourselves. Now with the advances in modern technology, uh, we can uh, know within a matter of seconds or minutes what um, a friend the other side of the world is having for breakfast, um, but we don't know uh, what emotion or what feeling um, is present in our own, in our own, our own minds. So the ability uh, to communicate um, trivial, um, pointless things has advanced incredibly. Uh, but our ability to be aware of what's really going on in our hearts and minds and what really makes us happy and what makes us unhappy um, is something that we give far too little attention to. So we need, I, I think, to be able to, to stop and to take stock and just to look, look what's going on here, right now. Otherwise, um, our 
uh, attempts our search for happiness will only ever be a, a kind of blind groping in the dark. And even when we, uh, through a fluke or good fortune or through some, some effort, we, have, we experience some happiness and pleasure in our life, uh, we tend to find ourselves unable to sustain it because we don't really understand the structure of it. And if we are uh, an uncultivated mind, particularly, uh, is constantly the prey um, of thoughts and emotions. And I'm sure you've had experiences where you're in a beautiful place with someone you love, someone you like, everything's going well, and then um, somebody says something, get offended, upset, um, anxious, insecure, um, some, and suddenly this negative emotion completely envelops the mind and all of the external uh, conditions for happiness become meaningless in that moment. So for the uncultivated mind, it's much harder to be happy than unhappy. And when we are, we do have these short bouts of pleasure and happiness we find extremely fragile and very difficult um, to ca take care of them and look after them. So, simple observation that for any experience of happiness uh, we need external and internal conditions uh, to be present, supporting conditions, and that the internal supporting conditions are more important than the external. They're not, the, they're not they don't completely um, outweigh or, or uh, replace the importance of external conditions, but they are more powerful. So you can be in a miserable place um, and um, you're in a good mood, you're in good company, or for some reason you're happy, and that mental state um, can mean that you're not uh, oppressed by the unpleasant situation at all. Um, whereas you can be in a wonderful place with wonderful people and feeling miserable and those things have no meaning at all. So the, um, so the importance of understanding the way the mind works and learning how to deal with the mind effectively is absolutely central to experience of happiness and to the education of the mind to be able to aspire to and to enjoy the more refined experiences of happiness, those which are less conditioned and less um, bound up with toxic mental states. So, um, an example is giving. Basic example, if we give, we share, we serve others um, with no wish for any kind of reward then uh, I think this is um, a form of uh, happiness and pleasure which all of you have experienced. And I think that it, if we compare that with the kinds of pleasures and happiness from um, beautiful sights, sounds, odors and, and tastes and so on, that there is a sense that this is somehow superior. It's on a higher plane. And if we make some sacrifice, we help someone, uh, we, we help to reduce or relieve someone's suffering, we're able to contribute to their happiness, and we do so in a way with no desire for any material or even um, emotional reward of any kind, then in the Buddhist tradition we call this a noble treasure of the heart. And why it's a noble treasure of the heart is because um, even if uh, time passes five years, ten years, twenty years um, later, if you consciously bring um, into the mind that memory of that act of kindness and goodness and charity, um, you feel immediate sense uh, of happiness. So it's a, it's the the happy um, the the happiness that we give, the kindness the acts of charity that we perform um, do not end with the act itself, but they can be a resource 
they're a treasure of the heart. And when we feel depressed, unhappy, sad, um, rather than seeking to um, escape from that through some um, pleasure or through some drug of some kind or some um, trivial pursuit, we can consciously recollect the goodness that we have uh, performed in the past and we can heal um, our minds and take our minds in a very natural and organic way out of that unhappy state to a happy state. So this uh, power of uh, recollection of kindness, kind acts, um, goodness that we have performed in the past, that happiness um, is, um, is superior, I would say, to the happiness that we experience from going on holiday and having a great time and enjoying ourselves because when you're in pain, physical pain, mental pain, mental distress, you remember times when you've had a great time in the past and um, it doesn't have that same healing effect, uplifting effect on the mind. The, um, I'd like to say, uh, let me see how long I've been talking already, quite a long time. Seems like I'm just starting to. Um, I'd like to say a little bit about morality, not a favorite topic of everybody, but um, Buddhist uh, morality um, is rather um, different in uh, its formulation. So morality in Buddhism is considered to be part of the education process. So it's um, an intelligent governance of how we act and how we speak. Um, there is no um, idea, concept, belief in a deity who rewards moral people or punishes immoral people. Um, we start off with the idea of what are the causes and conditions for nourishing, um, happy, um, secure communities, beginning with families, going on to um, organizations and societies and so on. So think that we can establish certain universal principles, one of which is trust. I, I would say that any um, happy uh, couple, any happy family, any happy um, community of any sort um, is dependent on people having mutual trust. So where, what, on, what, on what do we found our trust? On what can trust practically be established? Buddhist answer is um, on a very um, basic and simple faculty that we all possess. Um, we are all animals, we all have instincts, uh, animal instincts, but we also have this rather special quality um, of being able to stand back from, uh, we have a reflexive capacity and we have a reflective capacity and every day of our lives uh, we make choices um, where we say, I would like to do this, I would like to say this, but I won't. Why? Well, because it wouldn't be right, it wouldn't be fair, it wouldn't be kind. So it means that we can uh, weigh up um, the, the, the demands of passion and desire and instinctual um, uh, drives with standards, conventions, um, principles, ideals. And we can say, no, I won't do that. Um, I don't want to do that. Um, yeah. would, you, would I like to do it? Yes. Shall I do it? No, I, I won't do that. It wouldn't be right. It's such a um, common um, and ubiquitous part of our life that I think we overlook just how special that, that is. But this is what we use as a foundation for morality in, in Buddhist tradition. So we say that we live together uh, we're, we're always you know, going to have problems of one kind or another. You're gonna, even with you, someone with you love and respect, every now and again you're going to um, be irritated with them, frustrated, um, feel neglected, feel slighted, and so on and so forth. Um, 
But what we can all say is, even though sometimes I feel like I'd like to throttle you, you know, or I'd like to, I'd like to um, slap you around the face sometimes, I won't. Um, and even though I want to shout and swear and abuse you sometimes, I won't. That's my commitment to you. Um, I'm, I, I'm someone who uh, has um, all kinds of negative emotions arising and passing away. I, that's uh, nothing I can prevent um, as such. I can't, through an act of will, say that from now on I'm only going to have loving, kind thoughts for everyone. Uh, you, you become completely neurotic and riddled by guilt if you feel you have to be um, someone who only has um, these beautiful, kind, wonderful emotions. You like to, but it's not possible. But what you can say, and what we can say is say, no matter how, um, uh, how powerful these negative emotions are, I will not act upon them. I will not speak words through the power of those negative emotions. So if you're, if you're living with someone and you make that kind of commitment, you feel safe, you feel secure, you feel respected. Um, you know that even though that person might get angry with me sometimes, he's never going to hit me, he's never going to abuse me, he's never going to uh, verbally abuse me or, 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 or shout at me or, or whatever. So the, uh, the precepts that a lay Buddhist take um, five precepts not to kill, to steal, to commit sexual misconduct, to lie, to take alcohol or drugs. The actual phrasing of the precept which is taken is, uh, I undertake the precept to refrain from killing, harming, as a means to educate my conduct. This, this is the actual phrasing. Um, so it's, it's a training, it's an education of conduct that we take upon ourselves. Now if we, and in, in, the essential principle here is it has to be voluntary because you see the value of it and because you see the suffering and the conflicts that arise from not governing conduct. So with that wholehearted assent and aspiration to cultivate, to train uh, your conduct, you take on these precepts. And over the course of time, the um, being able to um, live your life within these boundaries, which you have established yourself, not been imposed upon you from outside, not keeping them because um, you're afraid of some punishment that comes, because you want to. Um, because it's, that's the commitment that you're making to this, to this life, to this community. Um, and when you're able to maintain those boundaries and those standards, even in difficult situations where there are all kinds of temptations um, to, um, to go outside of the boundaries or to break these, these commitments, after a while there's a sense of self-respect that arises self-confidence and a real uh, sense of happiness that comes. And, and so this is a, a kind of happiness which I, th I think people overlook or don't uh, necessarily aspire to. So, so this, and in Buddhist tradition, this whole day, uh, how, what, what's self-esteem? You know, we're talking about where does self-esteem come from? And so, Buddhist answer to this would be, firstly, in acts of generosity and kindness, and secondly, in being able to um, govern one's conduct within voluntarily accepted bound boundaries, or voluntarily established boundaries. Kindness and generosity is important because um, just as the mental state that we have affects our conduct, Similarly, habitual conduct affects mental states. And when we constantly give, then each act of giving, each act of service, helps to firm up, helps to um, uh, increase this perception of oneself as a giver, as someone who has something to give to the world. Um, as someone who finds joy in giving. So creating, skillfully creating a conventional identity of someone who gives, someone who has something to give. 
and someone who, can, who has boundaries and standards and can maintain them no matter what the external situation might be. So there's a lot of interest these days in, in Buddhist meditation techniques, um, but often uh, I feel it's rather superficial and people, I want to live uh, exactly the way I'm living right now, but I don't want to experience the, the tension and the mental suffering that arises from it. So I, I, I want to be peaceful, but um, how can I be peaceful without giving up all the things that prevent me from being peaceful? And so meditation can be um, just um, uh, a rather superficial um, therapeutic device, maybe a little amount of stress reduction. But in Bruce's point of view, it has to be embedded in this whole attitude to life of cultivation, cultivation of conduct, cultivation of emotions, and dealing um, with negative emotions well and positive emotions. So the training of the heart um, and that which is providing the foundation for the more subtle and the higher kinds of happiness is based upon effort. So the four kinds of effort. One is the effort to prevent the arising of unarisen toxic mental states. Um, how can we live our lives, act, think, um, care for our minds in such a way to prevent the arising of toxic mental states. In the case where unsuccessful toxic mental states have arisen, what are the steps that we can take to deal with those most successfully, to reduce them or to completely eliminate them? Um, what are, how can we live our life, how can we act and behave in such a way as to um, instill or to create positive uplifting mental states? How can we take care of them, nourish them, nurture them and bring them to, to maturity? So this is the essence of what we're doing in meditation practice. This is the direct um, application of these four kinds of effort. So it's not like meditation is this kind of thing you do in order to get a reward at the end of it, which you could call peace or enlightenment or whatever, but you're developing very important um, life skills. And meditation, you know, no matter um, how it might be in different religious traditions and, and so on, I think one of the important features of it is that it, we're stopping. Just for a moment, we're just putting down all these conventional identities of ourselves as sons, daughters, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, bosses, employees, students, and whatever, and just coming to this experience of life itself, unmediated by, by all these ideas and concepts, the raw experience of life itself. And um, one, uh, I'd like to... Um, share a, a kind of a, uh, an exercise or a mental uh, image. Let, let's, let's suppose that someone um, is incredibly self-confident and their confidence based on their ability to walk in a straight line. Okay. Let's, say, let's say it's me. So I, I believe I can walk in a completely straight line uh, for eight hours for a whole day. And and so I go out in the middle of the desert where there are no identifying marks, no, uh, no buildings, no trees, no anything. And I walk uh, for eight hours in a completely straight line. And I, I know, I can feel it, that I'm absolutely straight, even though there are no landmarks to prove it. And someone uh, is monitoring me and he uh, uses a compass and he says, well, that's really incredible. Ajahn Jayasaro's walked eight hours in a straight line and he's only deviated one degree from true north in, in eight hours. Amazing. So next day, I, I prove I can do it again and I, I walk in a completely straight line, subjectively, absolutely sure, and, and one degree in, in eight hours of walking is pretty amazing. But if I keep doing this, you see, um, after 90 days, you know, from true north, I, maybe I'm walking in a westerly direction. And in 180 days, I could be walking due south. So um, the analogy here is that I believe that so many of us um, wake up, 
to a certain extent, maybe in a cold sweat, two o'clock in the morning, 40 years old, how did I get here, you know? You know, I thought I was walking true north and I'm walking south, you know? Where, how am I doing exactly the same kind of things that I thought I would never do? All the things as a young man or a young woman, I thought, I don't want to get like, I don't want to be like that, I don't want to do that. And here I am doing it, here I am, I'm just like that. And, and I think that it, it's like this, you're just deviating. It's not like you're making these big, huge mistakes in life where you should go left and you go right, or you do some really stupid, dumb things. It's more just this general, just little by little, you know, just deviating from the path that you set for yourself in life. And um, one of the advantages of this daily period of meditation or reflection is, is just resetting the compass. Just, and when you stop, just for a while, then all this, suddenly you just get this thought like, like, why am I making such a fuss about such a stupid thing? Come on, just put it down. Or sometime else, something, this, this is not a small matter. This is really, I need to do something about this. So it's like we have all this uh, wisdom, just basic wisdom, but we, don't, we can't hear it. It's like there we, we've got this radio on and this really loud blaring music and this voice of this quiet voice of wisdom is completely uh, obstructed and obscured by this loud noise. So if we can make time every day uh, just to turn off the noise and to learn how to turn off the noise because it's not so easy and then to listen to this wisdom and we do, often we really do know what's what um, but we, we're comp we've lost that faculty of communicating with ourselves. We're communicating with some people all over the world and we're, we're not communicating with ourselves. So the... Um, just to, 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 to end the talk, I would just like to, to say that the fundamental conditioning um, factor for unhappiness uh, are the toxic mental states that arise from a lack of examination, lack of understanding about the nature of the body and mind. And that through looking, observing, learning from our experience, um, adopting this attitude of a student of life, a student of experience, um, then we can start to ground ourselves in those things that do make us happy. Um, and we begin to see a lot of things that we've been taught will make us happy. Yes, they don't. Um, everybody else may think so, and uh, the whole culture may be telling us so. We don't, but we look at our minds very honestly, it doesn't work. Um, and we can find that if our, uh, if our mind is bright and clear, we, we can develop this sense of love and enthusiasm, interest um, in our duties, our responsibilities, um, then even the most mundane um, and despised of um, activities um, can produce a real sense of well-being. So, we need to be taking responsibility for our lives. We, we give far too much um, importance to externals. Um, we say, he or she disappointed me so much. He hurt me. She hurt me. Um, and we give this power to other people and other things and completely denigrate our own self or overlook the fact that there's no body, there's no, there's no thing that can make us suffer. There are things that are triggers for suffering. But if there is not uh, some ignorance, some craving, some uh, internal toxic mental factor in, our, in ourselves combining with that, suffering cannot arise. Um, so if, if uh, we were to put a hand in a fire, whoever, whoever it might be, uh, it could be a saint, it could be a sinner, it could be a, uh, a professor, it could be a schoolboy, a man, woman, 
uh, Muslim Buddhist who ever put their hand in a fire to get burned because it's the nature of fire, the nature of human skin. But somebody says something slighting, someone uh, shows contempt for some other person. It's not the same, is it? Some, somebody might uh, have a very strong emotional reaction, somebody might have a mild emotional reaction, somebody else might have no emotional reaction at all. The same person uh, at one uh, particular time might have a strong emotional reaction, other time not. So many different things affecting the emotional reaction. It's not a simple cause and effect. So there is, um, we can look again and again that there are um, negative mental states, bad habits in, the, in our past that now we can see we are to a certain extent free of and that there are um, positive mental states that were not present in our life some years ago that are now. So we can conclude from that, I think, that we do have the capacity to make positive um, changes in our life, that, that this transformative um, power lies within ourselves. It doesn't lie um, outside, but it's something that we all possess by virtue of our, our human birth. So the um, experiences of uh, happiness become more and more refined, and the more and more refined they become means that the more and more stable they are, until it's not a happiness arising dependent upon a particular situation, a particular relationship, but that happiness is an expression um, of being. Um, and, in that case, and in that sense it's completely um, invulnerable and it's a refuge uh, and a joy um, throughout one's life. So I'd like to end the talk at this point. So I just want to say thank you very much personally on behalf of Georgetown and all of us here.